So, so I was just going to say um, welcome back and welcome to this second part of the session where we're going to be talking mainly about legal structures and some current funding uh, that, that's relevant in particular for some of the Time to Grow programme members of some of our wider Flourish network. Um, but I'm going to put that in the context of, you know, seven steps to starting. It says an enterprise and it is, you know, business is business, um, but we're looking at the, the, the sense of a social enterprise or community business. Um, so I was just going to have a bit of a recap. So through the Time to Grow programme so far, we've kind of been following this. I, until I looked at this slide, I hadn't realised actually that you forget these things are structured on purpose. <laughs> and hopefully this helps make it all make sense. So um, we've certainly, we've tried to help <clears throat> people on the programme so far take stock, you know, ask them, you know, why, why they wanted to do this <clears throat> and what are the reasons. We've helped you look at your skills through that you sort of Myers-Briggs stuff, other skills audits and other things. We've started to help people think, what is it they're doing? Is it products? Is it services? Is it something else? Um, and, and try and get a sense of why it is they want to do what they want to do and tease it out to make sure that you, you're not setting yourself up to fail and you're putting um, something together that's achievable. Um, we've then... We're looking at helping people refine their ideas. So going back to other sessions, and I've put links on here, that you can recap and refresh on this, but <clears throat> we, we ran a session around refining your ideas and there was a, an exercise we looked at called the problem tree. Some of you might remember where it was really getting you to think about the root causes of some of the social issues that you're trying to address and what kind of effect these have. And if you can look at what's the core issue and the main effect of what's going on, and you can look at what all the root causes are and look at why the wider detailed and you know bigger picture effects that are happening you can pinpoint your solutions to either where your skill set best fits or to where your knowledge best fits or to where there's most need and you'll have the biggest impact you know and you can you could be able to spot where your competitors are working or other projects and initiatives are working and where you can partner or fill a gap so that was you know we started to help people refine their ideas we then last session uh you know we were looking with joe at the, the business model canvas we looked at um all the different sort of facets of that but we also showed you the kind of two sentence um, business model canvas so that um you know if, if if looking at business model canvas is a bit too overwhelming right now and you're just testing and developing things that um the two sentence one um is quick and easy and um it's the kind of questions that any funding application might ask you actually, or any sort of what you're trying to get across in your pitch might ask you. So um, we, you know, we got to that point, um, you know, doing some research, you know, so you've all started to do this to some degree, or it's a constant ongoing process that you go through as you evolve your whatever project business campaign um, and thinking about, you know, who's buying this? And we've talked about customers, beneficiaries and stakeholders um, and, and how the, the difference between who's got the money, who's got the power and influence and who's got the genuine need for what you do. And, and thinking about who's who's who <laughs> helps you manage your time in where you're doing your research, where you're doing your networking, who you're sending information to, who you're going to expect different kinds of response out of and how you have to change your language according to who, you, who you're dealing with, who's your audience. Um, who, you know, we've not talked massively about competitors and competitor analysis. I've got a whole other session on that again, but um, it's key. Competitors, partners, allies, whatever you want to call them, however they sit, um, understanding what people are paying for other stuff, understanding the range of other services that are out there. Often people say, oh no, we're unique. Nobody else is doing anything like us. Nonsense is always my answer to that. Absolute nonsense. And um, even if you have something highly unique, what people don't realize, your competitors aren't just who else is baking, who else is doing this, who else is working with you know, ex-offenders, who else is, um, uh, who else is um, you know, running a health and wellbeing stuff um you you really have to think about it broadly you know as a sector you know you you are in a particular sector so who what, what else is going on in your sector and who else is operating even if they don't look sound or smell like a competitor somebody's paying money and you've got to convince your customers to stop buying from them and start buying from you 
Um, and so your competitors might be a completely different beast to you and you haven't realized that yet. You know, I would always think about your competitors is who are the people that your customers are already buying, procuring or accessing services from? Think about, you know, that. And then when you know who's who's accessing and spending money somewhere that you want to attract, you've got to convince them that um, they should be coming to you. Um, and yeah, so your competitors are often not, nothing like you. And we, we can talk about that again. <laughs> um, yeah, what makes you attractive and, and all of these sorts of things. There's more of this coming, actually. So we've started to think about this through some of the previous sessions. I'm pleased to say we've got a, a, a session with Yellow Jigsaw happening on the 16th of June. I'm hoping it's going to be a real world one. Um, it was it's in as day six on the plan and um it's the 16th of june we've thrown up the date it's a wednesday and um it should be 10 till 2 um, and we're aiming for real world um worst case scenario it'll be virtual either way it will be excellent um and it will build on a little bit of the kind of marketing 5p stuff but take it much more into marketing media and, and pr so i just sow that seed um Make a plan. We've been talking about all of this. There's clearly there's the business plan and the um, you know business model canvas and these sorts of things. But this is you know your operational plan really. How are you going to manage your time to fit it all in? What exactly is it that you have to do, or you and your team have to do, and when and how? Who's accountable for doing what? Basically, you can write ideas till the cows come home, but until you structure it week to week, month to month, and you, you work out what can you realistically do and what's are there not hours in the day to do, or it's not your area, it's not your area of expertise, um, you can then start to kind of think through what am I doing this week, what am I doing this month, what am I doing this project, what am I doing this year, however you need to carve it up. And, you know, here, you know, this is just a bit of a, an example, you know, it might be that someone's got to complete their business model canvas, and touch your body you know whoever it is is, is is committed to doing that there's some market research needs to happen supported by somebody else um, and you you know might need to apply for a startup grant and you know you might be getting some feedback or some support from us or from another agency so it's just working out what are the tasks that are going to get you from a to b um, and we've not spent heaps of time on project management yet but if people want that we can look at that then this is, the, this is the bit that I want to spend some time thinking about. You know, step five, think about legal structure and governance. We don't get bogged down in this straight away because, you know, you, you're testing ideas, you're having a go, you're thinking it through. You might, you, might go, you might tinker and do stuff for a good couple of years before you actually ever think about setting up a legal structure. So I would say don't get rushed into doing any of this. We never rush people into this stuff because... You know, you just need to build your confidence, build your networks, get your ideas clear and know what it is you're setting up a legal structure for and why. Because I'm, you know, I'm working with somebody now who's set up the wrong structure and they've now got to, you know, turn it into something else because they were given bad advice and um, they've rushed into setting up the wrong thing. Um, and, you know, that's what we try to avoid with people. Um, so basically, you know, just when we're thinking about, you know, legal structures and governance and the legalities of what you need to do, it's just reminding us, you know, there's legalities such as, you know, being transparent, transparent and accountable, you know, getting accountants or other other people in to help you make sure that you're accountable and transparent um, having the right policies and procedures, having appropriate insurance, making sure you're aware of, you know, appropriate health and safety, safeguarding, all of these things are, you know, Part, a part of doing what you're doing, depending on what you're doing, who you're working with, and at what level and scale you're operating. Then legal structure and form, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute, um, is where you're at the point where you, know, you, need to, you need to perhaps become more than you, or you need to kind of organise and represent yourself in a way that you can do various things. Um, and we're going to go through those in a sec. Um, and then around all of that, there's a kind of governance, you know, so you can have this legal structure, whether you're a one man band sole trader, that has got all these ethical ideas and wants to do profit for purpose, or whether you're, you know, some sort of recognised social enterprise or not for profit charitable structure, 
but so what you know you've got to be able to operate in a way that works you've got to have trust people on board you've got to know what it is you're actually meant to be doing otherwise you kind of you stall um, and you don't progress and grow in the way that you might have intended so that's just a backdrop to what we're going to do um i've just got a slide here on the different legal structures now some of you have already formed and we might come and ask you about that in a minute some of you haven't yet formed, but are thinking about it. Um, I know I've had conversations at length with some people, helping them sort of mull this over. Um, and what I would say is there's this, there's this spectrum, which is basically what we've got here. Um, and this slide shows you the different typical models that people will adopt when they're setting up um, an enterprise, a social enterprise. Um, and um, also how where it stacks up in terms of the way things often people are setting these things up because they want to be recognized um, in, in a particular way they're wanting to look at um, applying for funding is often the point at which social enterprises might form something um, and um, you know they want potentially they might want um, you know limited liability um, around what it is they're doing so this spectrum here on the one hand you've got the more philanthropic end of the spectrum you know company limited by guarantee with charitable status company limited by guarantee kick um, an unincorporated association that's um, not for profit um, like a community group constituted group and a bencom is um, a, co um, a charitable version of a co-op in the middle of the road um, you've got you know standard company limited by guarantee that's got not-for-profit clauses in it so it's clearly not a private business it's a not-for-profit organization um, company limited by guarantee kick can sometimes sit more in the middle of the road they're not all super philanthropic um, and you know they're not all reliant on, on funding and um, so they sit in that camp too co-ops um, we've got charitable incorporated organizations in the middle there um, charitable incorporated organizations are clearly charitable and on the charitable end of the spectrum but um, there are um, slight differences um, in that um, whilst directors can't be, you know, paid handsomely in a CIO, that there's, there's a there's, there are levels of expenses and remuneration that you can access in a CIO that you can't in a, a standard company limited by guarantee charity, which is why I've moved them in the middle. So there's, there's a slight difference between the two structures. Um, although, I from, as far as we're led to believe, most company limited by guarantee charities are going to be encouraged to become CIOs anyway over time. I think they're going to make them all one thing. Uh, that's what we're led to believe. And then on the more private end of the scale, you know, private businesses, any old private structure. So, you know, sole traders would normally sit in that camp, um, you know, private limited companies, companies limited by shares with or without kick status tend to sit in that camp. And there are co-ops um, that although they were co-op structure, they operate much more like a, a, a private business. So although they've got, you know, perhaps workers co-ops or, or um, co-ops with different kinds of dividends, um, they're operating more for sort of in the private market than in a sort of community, you know, housing co-op setting or something like that. Um, so those, you know, I'm going to go through it in a bit more detail in a minute as to kind of what these things are and why for, for ones that are relevant. But it was just to show that on the more you know, there is most of them, any old structure can crowdfund. Any old structure can go for commission contracts. Um, but those at the more philanthropic end tend to be able to go for funding and, and fundraising options and can go for philanthropic sort of loans and grants, social investment that's aimed specifically at them um, or grant, like grant loan mixes. Um, there are social investor loans um, that um, there's all sorts about now that great GMCVO have got a kind of social investment loan, social investment business, um, have all sorts of loans. Key fund that I mentioned before have all sorts of social investment loans. Um, they're, they're for those that have got a clear sort of business model that um, are seeking a loan um, in order to grow and scale and um, have, a, have a relatively clear way of seeing how by having this pump prime money, it will enable that growth to happen and they'll make, make more revenue so that they can then pay off the loan. You know, just um, like 
you wouldn't you know, with any bank really. Um, and then there are sort of equity models. And usually anyone going for equity investment would normally have be look, look and feel a bit more like a private business. There are some um, types of equity investment where you've caught the right person on the right day and the right time. And they want to give you more of a philanthropic um, package support investment. But usually, you know, equity investment is a more for those that have got a business model that is tried and tested and is seeking to grow and that investor wants some sort of um, return on its investment. So that's, those are the structures. And then in terms of how do you make your decisions on this stuff? Here's what we would normally be asking you or you, we'd be asking you to ask yourself, you know, you know, in terms of getting started, making decisions, you know, it's it, who do you want to own and govern this thing? How are you going to make, generate income? Are you going to make some sort of profits? Are there tax implications for how you're going to operate? How do you want to be seen by your wider community? How are you going to market yourself? What is it you want to say about yourself? And does your legal structure and governance uh, matter to your community of interest, your audience, your commissioners and investors? Um, and, um, you know, the levels of sort of um, legitimacy and commitment to, you know, social enterprise, being a charity, or, you know, being a community led organisation, all affects the kinds of structure that you might go for. Um, you know, there's, 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 there are models where you're incorporated, I'll explain that in a minute, and there's models where you're not. And so setting up as a company, you know, and, 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 a, and, a, and a co op, um, or as a charity, will end up having you incorporated, being a constituted group, um, an unincorporated association in effect, or a sole trader, you're not incorporated, um, which has sort of implications on um, your liability or how you're seen in law if, if you're going to enter into contracts or if you're going to um, you know, be sued, for example. Um, there's thinking about to what extent you want to build some sort of group team you know, the people around you and who's going to be involved. Um, thinking seriously about, you know, what is it trying to do here? You know, there are people who want to set things up, you know, for themselves, for their family, you know, um, and they don't really want to be a, a charity or a social enterprise, and that's absolutely fine. And there are people who know um, that, 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 that that's the right route for them. Um, you know, there are people who want to earn a good living want to be paid well um but you know other than that they want to make a difference and i would say you know if you're in that camp then there's a chance that setting up a, a, some sort of social enterprise or charity is potentially for you because you know as long as you're earning the money as long as you're bringing home the bacon you know you can pay yourself what you like um in accordance with you know what's in your business plans what's um you know relevant and realistic and what you're actually generating and so you can you can build your let, you know your um, security through your um, employment or through the way you're paid um, and the venture or the organization um, sort of almost sort of exists beyond you um, and can you know can generate surpluses that you can reinvest back in in the community and it's it's thinking you know is that relevant and right for me and um, one of the things that pushes it, it over the hurdle <laughs> into making a decision is have you actually got the cash to start this thing do you need some funding to make this happen because chances are if you're working in um, deprived communities or if you, something's mark a real market push where there's not real to market demand yet um, or not financially people can't pay or can't see fully the need for what you're doing yet or you've you've just not got the financial means to set everything up in the way that you would want um, in addition to wanting to make a difference um, then absolutely setting up a social enterprise is potentially right for you because you'll be able to um, raise resources look for grants and do other things that means that your business model whilst it can pay you it can pay other people it can cover the overheads of running what you want to do um is structured in such a way that it, you know you can apply for, for grants for you know either research and development and startup um, or for specific projects and programs or to subsidize the cost of being able to work with people who perhaps can't pay for, for what you're trying to run. Um, so these are usually the, the reasons why people start to look at a not-for-private profit structure. 
um, usually there's a real social purpose and some sort of community benefit and social value to what you're doing if there isn't it's hard to get a funder to be convinced of that um, and you know there are different kinds of social enterprises some are very community-led you know in the way that they run in the way that they're structured in who they engage and involve and others you know perhaps less so um, where it's you know two or three people you know, on the board and you know you might seek community advice you might get feedback and, and um, engage with your community in particular ways and um, but they're not involved in the sort of core running of what you do they vary um in terms of type but these are the sorts of questions that you'd be asking yourself ahead of getting the thing put together just for anyone who's this is new to um, and then we'll perhaps come and find out who we got in the room and are there any structures that you can just tell us what you went for and why. Um, so I've, I've run through these, but I'm just wanting to reiterate, you know, unin unincorporated organisations are where um, you're, um, you as individuals, so you as the sole trader or you as the individual people um, in that group, in that constituted group are seen as um, the, the people responsible for whatever's going on. So the book stops with you and um, you can take out Good insurance you can um you know run yourself uh you know you, you can run the organization or what the project or the activities really well and be transparent and operate just fine up to a certain threshold but there might come a point where being incorporated makes sense um either to go for certain types of larger funding to have limited liability so what that means is in your governing documents um where is it at an unincorporated association, new governing documents, a constitution. And I've got examples of those and I've been sharing those with people where that's relevant to look at how you might form a constituted group. So that's one type. Sole trader, you don't have one, um, but you have a UTR number, unique tax reference number. Um, companies limited by guarantee, limited by shares, have a memorandum and articles of association. Um, it's not a charitable and corporate association. I've not changed the slide. Um, organisation, I should say. Um, they have. It's, it's called a constitution, but it's it's more in depth than that. Much more in depth. Um, um, there you go. And um, they all have different bits of paperwork, basically. Um, and if you're unincorporated, as I say, you're seen as individuals, and the book stops with you. If there's slip trips and falls, or you enter into contracts and things do or don't go to plan, um, with an incorporated organisation, it means that you have um, li limited liability, to, usually to the value of a pound, which sounds very like, oh, brilliant. You, you know, you've still got to govern yourself well. You've got to be financially responsible. You've got to prove that you've run your organisation to the best of your ability, um, in, you know, in good faith and, um, you know, uh, ethically, um, should anything go wrong. But um, there is this limited liability clause within the the incorporated structures there, um, which has a sort of level of protection, if you will, um, in terms of should the company need to wind up or should things um, not go to plan. Um, and then there's co-ops, which we don't often talk about here because there's a big growing movement of co-ops in Manchester. Um, the home, you know, Rochdale, the home of the co-op and all of that. But um, their governing documents are called rules and there's a few different types. Um, the Cooperatives UK, and a number of other agencies that, that we know of support people to develop co-ops in, in different ways. And um, sometimes there are incentives and grants to set up co-ops in particular. Um, and if, you, if that's an area that's more of interest to you, let us know, we can put you in touch with the right people. But um, there's a bit more complexity around the law, you know, so the co-ops are a little bit more expensive to set up and that, um, there's more complexity around sorting things out legally. Um, there's much more case law when things do or don't go wrong within company structures than there is in co-ops. And that's, you know, can sometimes put people off. But more often than not, people want to use a cooperative and collaborative approach, but they'll often tuck it under a company structure. Um, but for where those people, you know, you know, the co-ops at the core of what they want to do and the, the, the sort of flat structure and uh, nature of, of the way co-op operates is going to work for people and um, then you know that may well be the, the structure for you what what we will often say to people is you know as i've said we don't rush people into setting these things up um, and i've often talked to people about setting up a constituted group 
with a minimum of three directors, or sorry, minimum of three uh, management committee or working group members that helps them uh, formalize what they're doing, have a vehicle for getting started and um, can physically start to apply for funds. So you're not automatically jumping into bed with people that you, you don't know too well to rush into setting up some company where you don't fully understand or know what it is you're doing. And companies cost a little bit more to set up, you know, setting up a constitution costs nothing. Um, it's not reporting back to any particular regulator and, um, but it gives you that flexibility to test trial and road test who the directors or future uh, key strategic or operational people might be in what it is you want to run. So that's normally the rule of thumb that I will take people down unless they've, you know, the, the business is up and running pretty much. They're ready to get going. They know already who they want to have as their directors and they're going to be up and running um, and applying for significant amounts of money um, you know, quickly, um, then setting up a company structure is usually more appropriate. But it's it's horses for courses, really. And um, it's, you know, it's down to what you want and need to do. So before we get on to the last few bits on some resourcing stuff, I was just going to come and just see if anyone's happy to come off, off camera and just, not camera, off mute and just let us know. Have you set up? Have you incorporated? Are you a constituted group? Are you a kick? Who have we got? I just wondered. Go on, Claire, far away. Um, well, at the moment, I'm just a sole trader and I've been one since 2007, even though I've had two completely different businesses. I've just always been like a sole trader, like minimal paperwork. You just crack on, do what you do. But it does mean that it's like when I closed my shop and I was left with a load of stock that I couldn't cancel the orders for, my credit rating absolutely tanked because as far as they're concerned, it's like, they didn't care that it was my business that took out the order. It's me that owes them the money. Yeah. Um, so if you want to ruin your credit rating, get yourself a shot, run it badly. <laughs> yeah, or don't. Um, for what I want to do now, I've already, I think, I already think I know what I want to be. So I know that I do want to be incorporated. Um, I, I do want to invest the surplus, but I don't want to be some kind of roaming about with holes in my shoes. I still... I need to still be able to pay my bills. I need to, I still want to drive a half decent car, not the 2004 Peugeot 206 that I'm tootling about in now. Um, I still want to be able to take my kids on holiday because essentially when I became self-employed the first time, I pretty much just halved our family's income. So instead of us being on like 80 grand between us, it was now like just whatever Mike brought in and me mainly just taking money out of the family. <laughs> it's, yeah, don't do that either. It's not great. Um, so this time, I, I think that what I want to be is a company limited by guarantee kick. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that that's based on everything I've read and everything I've heard. I think that's, I think that that fits what I want to do. And, so, and the, the difference with this, because sometimes people think, should it be a charity or should it be a kick? There, there are differences. Ch charities can often go for more and larger and uh, there's just more funding that you can go for. Um, but um, directors in charities typically can't be paid. There are some slight dispensations in a, in a, a CIO, but traditionally in a charity, the, the people running the charity um, strategically aren't paid they're there in a voluntary capacity um, yeah I run a small staff, charity and we never we've yeah. never took you, you we're lucky if we even bother claiming expenses back exactly um, but we certainly don't get paid yeah. but originally and, and lots of people in charities do I mean charity chief executives you know get paid 40 60 <laughs> 80 grand and, and more in large national organizations people don't realize sometimes people in charities Earn, earn a good living. I came out of the private sector to work in the charitable sector and I was earning more the day I walked into that charity than I did, you know, working in the furniture industry. So th there's money to, to, to be earned in the right way within a charity, but the, the governance wise, your trustees aren't paid there voluntarily. And people say, God, why would they bother? But, you know, there's a kudos being attached to being a charity trustee. There's learning and development and progression. There's payback, give back, um, there's all sorts of reasons why people come onto charity boards. So, um, and there's ways to find the right people. That's not what we're going to cover today, but we can talk about that again. And we've got sessions, listen again sessions on that. Um, but in a kick, 
directors can be paid and that's the difference and that's often when people are like oh you know you want to lead your thing you want to run it you don't want to be you don't want to be voted out <laughs> you know uh, then setting up I mean that can still happen in a kick but you know you've you've got more um, control to some degree over how it's governed how it works and you can build in the collaboration you can build in the not-for-profit sort of well it, it, it's all in there there's an asset lock in what you're going to do and that's the other difference in you know is that with um kicks over and above just a standard company limited by guarantee there's an asset lock uh, within within what it is you're doing so it's just worth thinking it all through carefully I, I know we're nearly at time and i've got a little bit more i want to cover so i was just going to see was the one alice looked like she was nearly going to come off yeah think you're a kick as well aren't you yeah well so yeah mine's a little bit complicated but I'll try and be quick basically I set up as a sole trader in 2016 I think um and that was mainly for kind of like uh, video production work and then about a year later I wanted to start doing things that were more kind of explicitly social Mm enterprisey so I decided to set up a kick um to kind of expand the scope of that work that I was doing as a sole trader already and also because I had in my head that I'd want to apply for funding um but actually what ended up happening and I think maybe it's a similar story to the one you mentioned before about people rushing in to getting incorporated mm-hmm. is that I it was a massive headache <laughs> and because uh, I didn't know how to do it and also I never needed to apply for funding because I was just getting a lot of work Mm. in exactly the same way I would as a sole trader. Mm. And so, and and it didn't seem like the people who were paying me to do the work ever really thought about it. It it wasn't adding any value. They didn't recognize the name of the CIC. They just wanted Alice. So then I was like, right, well, I'm not really, this, this kick doesn't really matter. So at the moment I still have the kick. Um, and also over the past couple of years, I was involved in setting up the Meteor Co-op, which is a community benefit society, Bencom. Yeah. So I think I was also like, I'm trying to set up this kick that I've never done before. And I'm also, you know, founding director of this co-op and it just, one of them had to go. Yeah. So the kick kind of has been, um, I guess, neglected in a way, but also like it just hasn't been needed. Mm. Um, so now I'm at the point where I'm thinking, where now I'm going kind of back on my own again after having spent my time with the meteor and got that to a point that I wanted it wanted to get it to Mm -hmm. and now I'm thinking okay do I bring the kick back because Mm -hmm. I would like to apply for funding but but do I actually need to or do I just continue as a sole trader or do I kind of think about bringing that's something that your your enterprise coach will be able to help you think around that there are some real benefits but it's you might need other people around you to deliver whatever it is that you go for through through funding through 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 that or you know think about what you're trying to do as a sole trader and who you're working with and are they you know you'd only go for funding for research and innovation projects or for um developing products and services that you can't find customers or funding for or for working in um, diverse and disadvantaged communities or with organizations that you know can't pay your your market rate as well you you know all this stuff but I'm just saying it out loud so that people listening can you know, yeah and I think you you said this last time we spoke and it, a lot of the work that I've been doing as a sole trader has been grant funded mm-hmm. it's just that it's been so, another organization who've got the funding and then contracted yeah. me in to do you make bit. a good point there as well you know it's how do you want to operate the, the, absolutely if you can work with the people who are prepared to write these damn bids and sweat till two yeah. in the morning but go for it and um, the only issue you've got with that is you've no control over it you're relying and waiting on them to find the time, have the skills and to win the bids. And even when they win the bids, those sneaky little monkeys can sometimes just, oh, shuffle you out of the way, you know, or go, oh, sorry, we need to buy this now. Or, oh, you know, we'd written you in for for, for 20 days, but actually we we, we only needed for five, you know. So all of these risks. That has happened to me. (laughs) Yeah. All of these things can happen and do happen. So it's about a level of control as well, which we mm-hmm. perhaps want to add on this slide. So I'd only flip back to this slide because some of what you were saying there goes back to if you ask yourself these sorts of questions, then it will the, the right solutions or the right opportunities will emerge. Um, and just to kind of um I won't go into the ins and outs of, of what I do because there isn't time here, but I I have a sole trader business that I do some of my a lot of my freelance work through. Obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, managing director of um, Flourish um, as a CIC, um, and I also run an unincorporated association called Pop Up Spa and Retreat. So I can talk to people in depth about 
any of these types of structures and you know I've helped people set up charities kicks standard companies constituted groups don't be blinded by the science <laughs> but do make the right decisions so um, we'll come back uh, to some of that shortly we're kind of at lunchtime and the most important slide here I feel like I'm gonna have to do an evening an evening session here because I really wanted to cover more ground but there's never enough hours in the day this is just I'm going to whiz through it you know step six or something we've been talking about funding and resourcing your enterprise you know what are your enterprise, you know, what are your investment funding options? We've just talked about that earlier on through our, you know, income generation cocktail session. Um, have you the skills and understanding of how to man manage and maximize your resources? So you might get this money, you might have this money, you might want this money. Do you know how to, 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 to communicate and to organize yourself around budgeting, basically budgeting, cash flow, and accounting and um, that's what this afternoon session is going to help me think about um, and as we've been talking around you know is funding and bid writing something you need to do um, yes no maybe um, there is another webinar I'm going to share the link to, on if you've not seen it already called you know achieving bid writing success it goes into the ins and outs of you know what 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 is funding you know it goes much more in depth on funding the types of funding how you go for it excuse me and how and what the kinds of eligibility criteria are and how to give yourself the best chance when you're going for these sorts of things. What I wanted to highlight just now, and I'm going to send you a bunch of links to all of these, or as many as I can, when I email you after today, typically where you'll be at as an individual, Unlimited in pink, and the School for Social Entrepreneurs in pink, work with individuals. A handful of other, you know, Paul Hamlin, Ideas to Pioneers, I should have made pink because, you know, they will work with individuals um, at kind of early, fairly early stages. So I highlight those as a starter for 10. <laughs> and then once you're in a position where you might have moved on and wanting to look at um, constituting or forming and incorporating as a company, depending on what's the right method for you, all sorts of other funds open for you. So currently... If you are an, um, constituted um, or in the process of, um, you know, Forever Manchester, uh, this Empowering Women Fund that's come out that I talked about um, on our evening session recently, We Love Manchester, Awards for All and Neighbourhood Grants are where I would be going. They've all got money. They're all live. That, don't be wrong, there's deadlines on certainly on the Empowering Women Fund, but the, the rest, they're all there and waiting for your applications. So, um you know, the things to think about. Um, we talked about crowdfunding before. I just flagged up crowdfunder, Space Hive, and Just Giving. Crowdfunder, I, I rate highly. I think they've got a great platform. It's easy to use. Lots of social enterprise and community groups use it. Um, it's got some good, easy ways of both marketing yourself, creating easily understandable rewards. They've got a marketplace and, and a group community of people that are already using it. Um, Space Hive um, is one that's based more around place um, and, and they're all about localised and community regeneration in the main or they're certainly around spaces and places um, and that's what most of the, the things that are on there will be focusing around uh, regenerating particular areas in different ways through either asset development or community new community services or um, arts and cultural and um, environmental regeneration is kind of what sits in that ball pool and just giving um, is much more sort of a, again a charitable uh, site that a lot of you may have may, may not have invested in um, but th there's three examples there of, of sites that anybody you know who's got you know community initiatives um, and uh, community projects that they're wanting to develop can can access um, there is I spotted this while I was looking there's a webinar that Mac running Manchester Community Central um, and it's free and it's all about fundraising um, and writing bids and these sorts of things so I just put that in there as something that might I'll pop it in the chat it might be it's coming up soon I thought if we've not got time to cover it you can go to that <laughs> um, and as I say I'll share my um, achieving bid writing success link um, I'm gonna suggest that we break for lunch in a second just so there's time for you to get a good 20 30 minutes Gerge is here bang on one I'm afraid um so bring your butties back and um, we'll we'll um you might need to 
have him on while you're nibbling because we've run over a wee bit. But um, there's there's the link that's in that slide in case anybody wanted to look at that event. It's virtual, it's free. I'd, I'd recommend it, I think. Um, I'd recommend mine probably more, but anyway, <laughs> but that's, that, that's me. Um, and then um, something that we're not covering today, but it's things to think about last but not least, you know, you've had your ideas, you've figured out how you're planning and doing what you're doing. You are, um, you know, you've worked out your structures, you've, you know, it's all coming together, but, you know, it's, it's a constant learning journey, working out how you're going to run what you're doing, you know, where you're going to operate from, who's going to be part of this team and how is it going to all work? You know, have you got access to the kinds of software, tech, um, kit, equipment that you need? And how's that going to change over time? Um, and also, as we are, um, you know, thinking about the context, the constraints and the considerations of trying to run what you're doing through a pandemic and, and coming out of that, hopefully. So um, those were our seven steps to starting or, you know, continuing. <laughs> um, I hope that was helpful for this morning. And um, I'm going to stop recording and um, say, go get some lunch. And we can pick up on questions a little bit later. I will check the chat. I mean, checking it as we go, but um, thanks for joining us there and I'm going to...